Hi, and welcome to another episode of About the Authors TV. I'm your host, Jake Brown. Encyclopedia Britannica has recorded its official history that since the mid-1980s, John Sayles has been among the most prominent independent filmmakers in the United States. Parlaying his fees as a screenwriter of mainstream Hollywood films into funding for his own ambitious projects, Sayles created an ovira in which the personal and the political intersect at the heart of the American experience. Beginning way back in the mid-70s with the publication of his first novel, Pride of the Bimbos, an eclectic writing career as both a best-selling author who was nominated for the National Book Award when his second novel, Union Dues, was published in 1977, and later an Oscar-nominated screenwriter for Passion Fish, which Rolling Stone magazine raved ranks with Sayles' finest achievements and provides a damning comment on the sexism of movies today that Sayles' plain good sense now seems revolutionary. He'd follow up with the short story collection, The Anarchist Convention, and then the novel Los Gusanos, before Interview Magazine and profiling his groundbreaking work, A Moment in the Sun, mused that the prolific indie auteur and author is a storyteller with a talent for illuminating political themes through probing character studies. Through his fourth novel, The Thousand Page Opus, Sayles follows one brigade in the Philippines, interweaving stories from the Yukon to the back streets of Manhattan to shine a light on the compromises the people and countries make in their quest to survive. Newsweek felt that within the absolutely vivid novel, that Sayles' creative strengths are on full display, while NPR discovered within its pages that the author has managed to create a work that is both cinematic and literary in its scope and style, a blend so entrancing that you could polish off its 955 pages in one long weekend. If you only read one book this summer, make it a moment in the sun. Yellow Earth would garner similarly round critical praise as one that, in the opinion of the Chicago Review of Books, moves at a sensational pace. While within his latest James McGillivray, The Renegade Story, the historical novel society observed that reflecting reality is the strength of this book, adding that after living with Jamie for over 700 pages, I was sad to part with him. Booklist was quick to add that the acclaimed screenwriter, director, and novelist blends his wide-ranging narrative skills to great effect in this sprawling historical epic. Sales' grand visions yields a rollicking yarn that'll satisfy the discerning historical adventure reader. Responsible for other treasured independent cinematic classics like Lone Star, Men With Guns, Return of the Sea Caucus 7, City of Hope, Honey Dripper, Amigo, Silver City, Limbo and Sunshine State, the O. Henry Prize Award winner joins us today to talk all about his amazing career on the page and screen. John, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being with us. I really wanted to begin by telling you that your films had an enormous influence on me growing up, including your writing one of my favorite movies of all time, Breaking In. Ernie is a classic, and if you don't mind, we'd love to kick off talking about the writing of that film. Did you write the master burglar part with Burt Reynolds in mind? And did you envision these capers yourself or pull them from the headlines? I'm sorry I never got to meet him, because um, from people I know who worked with him, uh, he was a better actor than he thought he was. Um, he often was pretty denigrating about his own work. And uh, I, I got to um, talk with Bill Forsyth, the director. Um, they, they just uh, came out with a, a new DVD version of it or something like that. And uh, we did a talk for it. And um, I, 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 all the time, I, I had a hard time understanding Bill because he's, he's very Glaswegian. It's a very thick accent. And I would always have to ask him to say things again. And then I realized he wasn't always understanding me. So when I, when I asked him, um, you know, uh, how many weeks did Bert have? He said only one, but it fit really well. It evolved. Um, that was originally a short story. And I, I never got it to work as a short story. And I put it aside for about a year. And then I, I felt like, well, you know, the, the opening of it where they're kind of both breaking into the same house, that would work so, so well as a movie. And then as I wrote it as a screenplay, there's, there's more time than in a short story. And so I developed Ernie a little bit more. But the thing that struck me um, in, in doing the little research that I did about it was that kind of like evolution, safe crackers and the safes they have to crack, you know, one gets a little more complicated and the other has to get a little smarter and one gets more complicated and the other has to get a little smarter. Um, if you remember Michael Mann's Thief, um, that was the first 
movie where they use burning bar technology instead of the old soap and, you know, pouring liquid stuff down it. You can only crack um, old safes with old technology. And that was the old technology. And so there's a point made in the movie is that they, they you know, they scout out the safe to make sure it's something that they can crack. Um, it, they, they had just gotten in the t technology in like 7-Elevens of you know, burying the thing in concrete in a floor. So you couldn't kidnap a safe anymore. Um, but that was the kind of classic way that an old timer would have done it and would have been proud of doing it very well and having gotten away with it over the years and, and those kind of things. What are the venues that have a lot of cash that's not marked? And um, obviously a, a, a big fair or something like that is one. And how do you get the stuff off the premises if the safe is in the middle of it well obviously you have to hide it on site and have some way of getting it off um uh stanley kubrick did something similar in the killing um you know which is a racetrack you know robbery um but yeah you you, you have to think about you know all of those things you know how do you, you know, um, find the safe? How do you figure out what kind it is? How do you get in there? How do you get out? And how do you get the money out if it's bulky? And I just felt like, okay, this is a guy who the metaphor for him is when he hits that, you know, he, he hits a hole in one and there's no one for him to see because most criminals get caught because they tell somebody, you know, they're so proud of getting away with it that somebody has to be told or else it, what's the point, you know, even in criminal society. So it just becomes known that so-and-so did something. And, you know, that I just felt like here's a guy who is very successful, but uh, at the cost that he has to be totally cut off from society. And, you know, hence the name breaking in, here's this kid who's dying to break into something some friendship, some world where he has some status. And, um, you know, finally, they can't be partners. So a question I wanted to ask you since the late 1980s when this film first became one of my lifelong favorites, whatever happened to Bernie? Did he continue to be a cat burglar or did he retire? I think he, he is one of these guys who has a certain nut. And as long as he doesn't go below that nut, he's very careful with his money. You know, so he, he, he's kind of become a square John. He's kind of become, you know, a citizen. Um, it's just that he's old enough to seem like he's retired. And so he doesn't have to have a story about where his money comes from. But if he if he's in trouble, you know, um, he probably does another job and he probably sends some money to the right people um, to make sure the kid is OK in jail. You know, probably know somebody in that jail. Similarly, did you envision the Firestone Kid, a.k.a. Mike, as a character that would go straight himself after he got out of prison, given all the money Ernie was holding for him from the 4th of July job? I think that he's, he's you know, he, he wants to belong so badly. Um, I think he's likely to meet somebody inside um, to be a new partner. Uh, maybe not as smart as Ernie, and, you know, I'm afraid he's, he's one of these guys who... Um, isn't as smart as he thinks he is, and he's going to get in trouble again. Variety said of Eight Men Out that it's perhaps the saddest chapter in the annals of professional American sports, and is recounted here in absorbing fashion. Had you long wanted to make a movie about the famed White Sox throwing of the 1919 World Series? And who were any key players you wanted to focus on in the script and film, as portrayed by John Cusick and Michael Rooker and Charlie Sheen and so many other greats? And I've long wanted to ask, did you choreograph the series as played or maybe misplayed by the original team? I had grown up wondering how could they do that? You know, it's, it's kind of religious when you're a kid baseball, how could you throw the world series? And then I read um, a long prose poem by the Chicago writer, Nelson Algren. And he's talking about those guys who he grew up watching because he was a Chicago guy. Um, and, and he kept giving little footnotes to Elliot Azenoff's book, Eight Men Out. And so I found Elliot's book and read it and felt like, oh, this would make a really good screenplay. This would make a really good movie. Right at the time that um, my second novel, um, Union Dues, was sold to um, a publisher who had a deal in Hollywood um, with an agency that said, Wh whatever books you have, 
we will try to, you know, get somebody to option them as movies. So I, I said, well, I don't think this is, you know, Union Dues is going to make a movie, but um, give me the number of that agency and I'll call them up. And uh, they said, okay, well, send us something that you've written. And as a sample, I adapted Eight Men Out into a screenplay. So that's a screenplay that I wrote 11 years before I got to make the movie. Now, the good thing that is back in those days, the box scores um, for the World Series anyway, um, they were very detailed. So, you know, so-and-so grounded too short for what the first out. And then this guy did this. And so you, you basically knew every play of every game. And it was unusual in that they were experimenting with this idea of having nine games in the World Series, which um, turned out to be too many um, <clears throat> to hold people's interest. Um, but that was a lot of games to cover. And so what I was able to do, I was able to um, do the storyboarding and the blocking for the baseball part of the movie 11 years before I made it. And that didn't change because it's always 90 feet from home to, to first base. And it's always the, the same to second base. And if somebody hits a, a single to right field, you know where all the, the defensive players are gonna be and you know what the runners are gonna do. I think the, the, the real characters whose families we meet are the ones that I, you, 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 I want the audience to care the most about. You know, so that's Buck Weaver and Eddie Seacott um, and Joe Jackson. Um, those are the guys that you, you kind of have some sympathy for um you know that it was not a team where you know there were little factions on the team and they played really well together but they didn't get along off the field and um and those guys were the ones who in some ways lost the most um you know who had some feeling for the game um you know joe jackson kept playing until his 60s you know down in south carolina um Eddie Seacott always felt bad about it. Um, so, you know, those were the guys who I, I felt like I, I could spend a little more time on and you could, you could meet their wives and see a little bit of their home life. One great source was Ring Lardner, of course, who I played. Um, Ring Lardner traveled with both the Cubs and the White Sox as a sports writer. And the famous story about um, Ring Lardner is that he got his... Um, you know me, Al, kind of um, style. Um, he was on the road with one of the teams and he noticed that this player would always sit next to him at breakfast and always, whatever he ordered, this guy would order the exact same thing. He'll just say, I'll, I'll, I'll have the same as him. And eventually he realized, oh, the guy's illiterate. He can't read. And he would experiment and he'd order something new and the guy would order that as well. Um, and then it just became this kind of thing that was known between them without anybody saying it. And one day the guy came to him and said, uh, I want to play a joke on my wife. Um, I want to tell her that I learned how to type and you've got a typewriter. So I'm going to read, read you a letter and you're going to type it and make it like I typed it. And because the guy, you know, spoke in his vernacular, Ring Lardner is typing this vernacular and, and he realized I should be making the spelling errors that this guy would make and you know, those kind of things. And then eventually became his voice for an awful lot of his stories. So I had that to read. Um, I also watched some of the, you know, the early, early talking movies. Um, I showed the players a movie called City for Conquest with Jimmy Cagney and um, uh, let's see, Ilya Kazan's in it as an actor and Anthony Quinn is in it. And it's one of those rags to riches and back to rags again kind of stories where everything in the world happens in under 90 minutes and they all talk really fast. <clears throat> and so I, I said to the guys, I said, except for Joe Jackson, who is this Southerner who everybody kind of make, makes fun of because he's so rural. Um, you're going to talk at that speed and, and I have to get this movie done in two hours. That was my deal with a studio who's making it. And you're going to help me by talking fast that they did what ball players will do as a cast is they, you know, they kind of gave each other a lot of grief and 
uh, about their ball playing and their personal habits and all that kind of stuff. They hung out, you know, after the shoot. <laughs> they were in the dugout when they weren't out there playing. Um, they had uh, tobacco spitting contests. Um, you have a thing called a whiteboard that reflects light on people's faces and they would do Rorschach blots with, with tobacco spit on the, you know. Um, and so to see that kind of develop among them and uh, it's a little different than the characters, but sometimes they would do it in character. You know, sometimes they call the other guy by the character to, to just kind of help them get into it. They were all of them <clears throat> good athletes. I would say that D.B. Sweeney and Charlie Sheen were the most natural ball players who, you know, could have gone, you know, I think D.B. actually uh, went to college on a baseball scholarship and Charlie had a real arm on him. He was later in major league and, you know, quitted himself really well in that. Um, the other guys were athletes and um, we had a, a ex-major league baseball player named Ken Berry, who'd been a, a center fielder for a couple teams. And um, he was my kind of trainer for these guys. And I said, you got them for a week. I don't want them to pull any muscles while we're playing or throw their arms out. And here's a list of the skills that each one of them is going to have to do. It might be sliding. It might be turning a double play. It might be, in, in David Strathairn's case, um, throwing a curveball that looked like a curveball. And David developed a really nice big curve. Um, a funny thing was that we, we later did a, um, um, a benefit for a group called BATS, which was a bunch of ex-major leaguers uh, who were raising money for the guys who played before there was a pension plan. And um, they were, you know, Enos Slaughter and Warren Spahn and uh, I think Lou Brock was there and a bunch of guys, you know, I had their baseball cards when I was a kid and fun to meet them. And when I asked them afterwards um, what they thought of the movie, almost everyone just shook their heads and, and said, I wish I could have hit against that pitching. Because it was fast, but if it doesn't move and be fast, that's like batting practice. It must be tremendously helpful to have been an actor yourself and knowing how to write from so many different characters, so many different characters' points of view on a team like this. It helps. It helps having been an actor. Uh, it helps in writing, especially in that you're when you're acting, you're always saying, okay, here's the text, but what is going through this guy's head? You know, how does he see the world? Um, you know, what, why is he reacting this way, you know, that the author has, has given you? Um, and so when I, when I direct a movie, um, I write a bio for every actor, even, even the small parts. That's, um, it's just kind of the stuff that's not necessarily in the script, you know. Um, have you been married? How long have you been married? Is it a good marriage? How many kids do you have? How do you feel about this? How do you feel about this other guy? It may not be spelled out in the script, but this is going to help that actor when they, when they come to the scene. Um, and then I think the other thing is um, the important thing when you're, when you're acting in something, whether it's a play or a movie, is not to play the end of the scene at the beginning of the scene your character doesn't know how it turns out. You've read the script as an actor, but the character doesn't know how it turns out. And that's, that, that's kind of the most useful direction you can give actors when they're in trouble. It's usually they're playing it like they know what's going to happen next. Traveling back to childhood, were you as big a fan of stories told on screen as they were in books? And who were any favorite authors or filmmakers who had an influence on you back then? I think it was movies and TV was the first media that was my main storytelling media, although I liked books at the same time and when I got to, to, to you know, read different things. Um, but I didn't know anybody who made movies. I didn't know anybody who made TV. I didn't know anybody who'd written a book either. And so it was all kind of this nice thing of <clears throat> there are stories out there. And I uh, was interested in how they were put together. I, I think when I started reading, um, I noticed technique fairly early. I remember um, reading, uh, I think his name is Farley, the guy who wrote The Black Stallion, which was later made into a movie. Um, 
reading that and then realizing, oh my God, he's, he's changed point of view in the last chapter. And the last chapter is the race, which should be the, the most thrilling, you're there with a kid. And he doesn't tell it from the kid's point of view. He tells it from a handicapper, an old man who's always wanted to handicap a triple heap. And there's three horses running. And, and you know, the, the punchline, if I remember it is something, is like he put it, he should have put another eighth of a pound on the stallion. And you realize the stallion won because it was, he, he won by that little, you know. So I don't think I was aware of movie technique as I was of fiction technique. Um, Cause you, hand, you hold it in your hands. And, you know, when I was growing up, we didn't have videos of things. We couldn't watch them over and over again. You kind of watched them and then tried to recreate them in your head if you liked them the next day. Um, but certainly I saw a lot of movies on, on television and I, I just kind of had a feel for the way that stories were put together on the screen. They say when you get to college, you meet lifelong friends and you not only met your life partner, Maggie Renzi, who became a future creative collaborator, but Gordon Clapp and David Strathern. Reflecting back now on your years at Williams College, how did your path as an actor, writer, and director advance? Williams at that time did, did not have a drama major. Um, uh, so, but it had this beautiful theater, you know, the Williamstown Summer Theater um, was there. I later got to act in that um, with uh, Karen Allen and, and uh, Joanne Woodward in um, Glass Menagerie. Joanne Woodward played my mom. Um, but so they had this beautiful theater and then they had a downstairs theater which was kind of open up for grabs. And so you could, you know, go to the few people who were running it and say, I want to put on a play. And they'd say, well, okay, you seem like you almost know what you're doing, you know, go ahead and do that. So I got to, I got to direct a play or two there. I got to act in a play or two there. I didn't really start acting until my junior year. Um, but it was because of that, there wasn't um, the pressure of, a grade being put on it or people fighting for, you know, a recognition within a department. Um, you know, you could kind of cast whoever you wanted um, and they didn't have to be, you know, somebody in the, in the drama department. Um, there was a professor named Charles Thomas Samuels who was a Henry James scholar, but who was ultra, also interested in movies and he taught the only thing like a film course. And that would, would a couple uh, Januaries, they had um, what was called winter study program, where in January, um, you just did one thing, you took one course. And the first year I took it, he did um, Ingmar Bergman's films. So I got to watch all of Ingmar Bergman's films, including the first couple, which aren't very good, until he got the hang of it. He was really a theater director when he, he started making movies. And then the next year it was a bunch of different movies, um, you know, Italian neorealist realist movies and Japanese movie. And I had never seen a foreign movie with subtitles until I went to college. So it was kind of an eye opener to me and, and you know, really good movies. And then, you know, then you'd see it at night and then the next day you talk about them. And he had gotten um, uh, uh, this, this kind of projector that you could stop on a frame and it wouldn't melt it. Um, so, you know, he could stop and start the movie the next day and you could talk about it. And that analysis I think was very rare even in film schools in those days. So, you know, I, I was a psych major. Um, I, I didn't take history classes. I didn't take English classes. Um, I took that, you know, winter study thing and uh, the rest of the time, I was mostly reading novels and watching movies. Before heading to Hollywood, you first got your foot in the door writing short stories for The Atlantic. How encouraging and inspiring was it to see your first bylines? And how did this lead to the original idea to tell the story of the Brooklyn Bimbos, a five-man baseball team playing in drag throughout the South, as depicted in The Pride of the Bimbos, your first published book, which came out way back in 1976? Short stories are very compact. They're they're kind of like a good good um, short novel in a way, in and with, with a you know or a good short television show. You you, you kind of have one idea that you're going to one arc that you're going to um, deal with in them. 
Um, and so I, I started writing them and, and sending them off to magazines. Um, there were probably four or five that actually paid money back then. Um, I think there was like Esquire, Playboy, um, maybe the Atlantic did pay something. Um, really not that many. <laughs> And then there were quarterlies, and some of them were more prestigious than others. I had gotten one of those um, best stories of 1957 or whatever kind of books and looked in the back and they had a list of the, the quarterlies that they, you know, the magazines that they um, read from to, to pick the winners. And so I was sending stories off to totally inappropriate places because I'd never seen these quarterlies. And I, I would get, you know, something like, um, we at Ararat enjoyed your story, but Ararat is the Armenian National Quarterly, and there are no Ar Ar Armenians in your story. You know? um, and so I, I take that one off the list. Um, and so I was starting to paper a wall in my apartment in East Boston um, uh, while I was, uh, I, I worked in the hospitals and I, I worked in a sausage factory for a while in East Cambridge. And uh, then this, very long story that I wrote and sent to Atlantic um, just kind of disappeared and I thought they had lost it. And then um, I realized that my carbon copy of it had been destroyed when there was a flood from the apartment above me. And I was worried because I, I didn't really have many notes on it or anything and I wasn't gonna be able to redo it. And then they got in touch with me and said, we have your novella here. So I think somebody just said, oh, th this isn't a short story. It's a novella, send it over to the press. And um, I met with uh, Peggy Intima, um, one of the editors there. And she said, well, you know, if you, if you should cho choose to um, make this, like give it a plot and make this into a novel, we'll look at it, which was more encouragement than I'd gotten before. You know, occasionally they would write on your rejection slip, try again. And that was like a big deal. Um, but, uh, and then when they accepted the novel, I realized, oh, if I send them a couple of short stories that they've already rejected, different people will read them. And so then I got two, two stories published, um, in the Atlantic magazine, which was nice. Um, but yeah, I, I like short stories and I, I, you know, just because there are just not that many, um, venues for them. Um, I, I haven't written many in the, in the past years. I often try to make chapters in my novels work like a short story. And, and when I do a reading tour, um, I often, that's, those are the ones I choose to read. You then began working in Hollywood under the great Roger Corman. Looking back, would you reflect a bit on what some of the greatest lessons in filmmaking and screenwriting you took from that tutelage word that stay part of your creative process today? I think working um, on those movies, I, I wrote three movies for Roger. First of all, it's very rare for a screenwriter to go to Hollywood and write three screenplays and have them all made. So that was huge to actually get them with other directors, but get to see them on a screen. Um, the other thing was really working with those screenwriters and working with Roger and his assistant, Francis Dole, um, learning what, what costs money when you're making a movie and what you can actually just fudge with a lot of work and creativity. Um, so, you know, the more locations you have, the more expensive the movie's gonna have. Period is more expensive than contemporary. Uh, night shooting is more expensive than day shooting, things like that. Um, even just simple things like, if you have one character who you have to, um, he has one line next week, you've got to pay him for that whole week according to Screen Actor Gill's you know, rules. Um, so couldn't you either reschedule or give that line to somebody else? And you just saved yourself you know, $2,000 or whatever. Um, a lot of those very, very practical things. And then um, also learned a lot about rhythm, um, working with Roger on those movies, um, the rhythm in a, of an action movie. And, and one of the things that Roger always would say is it wasn't just all blood and gore. It was um, 
okay, I think we need a little bit more rest period for the audience before the next piranha attack. Um, so if you think of the, um, the a, a suspense movie as a roller coaster ride, you have to have some of those periods where you're going up and up and up and up and the audience is thinking, oh my God, when we start to go down, we're getting really high, we're getting really high, and then boom, down. Um, if you just start at the top and go down, um, you probably don't have enough ammunition to do that unless you're George Miller and you're making a Mad Max movie because his movies are like Space Mountain. They just start and they're true, they go down. Um, those are much more experienced, I mean, much more expensive movies um, than we were making at, at the, you know, Roger Corman's company. Speaking of another cinematic masterpiece from that side of your catalog, Rolling Stone magazine would write that Passion Fish ranks with your finest achievements, adding that as you translated your vision from script to screen via the acting performances you directed from your own script, Mary McDonnell and Alfie Woodward shine too, with the rich roles writer-director John Sayles provides them here in an acutely funny and affecting duel of wits that ranks with Sayles' finest achievements. Is it true that you were inspired in part to write this script based off your own time working as a hospital orderly? I was wor not working jobs to get ideas. I was working jobs to make a living. Um, but certainly having worked in, in uh, hospitals and nursing homes, you know, um, you have a, and I, I work with a lot of spinal cord patients. Um, the, the literal um, spark of it came when um, I, I have some, uh, uh, collapsing discs in my back. And I went to the hospital for special surgery in New York and I'm sitting there and I feel like a total faker because there are people with obviously worse problems than mine sitting in the same lobby you know, with really bad scoliosis. Um, and there were three or four white women in, in chairs, in, in uh, wheelchairs being pushed by women of color. And I just felt like, oh, that's an interesting dynamic. You know, that's, that's really interesting. Um, and I, I had recalled the Ingmar Bergman movie, Persona, which is about an actress who just suddenly stops talking, you know, has, has just had a, a psychic break. And she's out in the boondocks with this nurse taking care of her. And the nurse just talks all the time because the other person doesn't talk at all. And I felt like, oh, if there was an American version of Persona, this is what it would be. There would be class and race involved in it as well. And an interesting power dynamic in that one has power because she signs the checks and the other has power because she can wheel you out on the lawn and leave you there. And you can't necessarily get back on your own. You know, she has power because she's physically powerful. And these are two women who have had some hard stuff happen to them in life. And by the end of it, um, you feel like, okay, they at least want to be happy again. They're at least willing to take that try to be happy again. Um, whereas when we meet them, they're both kind of rolled in a little ball ready to die. What's interesting is one of the nice things about um, acting is that you can you can change a part without changing a line in it. And so who you cast and how you direct them is very important. So a lot of my technique in, in directing Alfred Woodard and, and Mary McDonald in that was kind of like um, staging a, a boxing match and being the corner man for each of the fighters and running over to this side and not, not wetting the other and said, okay, this time, don't let her get away with that. You know, I mean, she's kind of bullying. You. I just put your foot down, you know, even though you, it's paralyzed, put your foot down. And, you know, um, and that would change the dynamic of the next time they do the scene a little bit. And what good actors do is they listen to each other and they play off of each other. So you get two good actors in the ring together like that. And every take is dynamic and every take is slightly different, even without changing a line based on a town up in North Dakota um, that's actually um, closer to uh, a reservation that has, uh, you know, three different tribes on it. Um, Standing Rock is, is mostly Sioux, um, but the, the reservation I'm, I'm basing it on mostly has uh, 
um, Arakira, Manden, and Hadatsa people who, you know, worked the thing out together. Um, and when the shale oil came in, I had had an idea about writing a book like this once again, 20, 30 years earlier, um, when there was shale oil discovered in Wyoming. And it became a huge mess, you know, for the communities that, you know, and it was a boom and a bust. And I've always been fascinated with that boom and bust, um, you know, phenomenon. I have friends in Alaska and, and shot a movie up there. Um, their boom and bust was the Exxon um, Valdez spill. Um, because the cleanup, so many people came in to clean up and they were being paid by the federal government and the oil companies so much money that all the same things that would come with an oil boom came with an oil spill. Um, you know, all of a sudden there was no housing, people are making too much money, uh, drugs and prostitution come in and kind of overwhelm the local law enforcement. Um, it becomes a real frontier you know, wild town like Dodge City must have been. Um, then when you add the fact that um, that particular, you know, um, uh, the Bakken Range um, shale oil find spilled over onto Indian reservations and the complicated history between the United States and the Indian reservations. Um, and you got, you know, you got, um, tribal council people who just said, you know, we're going to go for, you know, sovereignty by the barrel. We can tell the federal government to go fuck off. Um, we're making our own money now and we're in bed with the oil companies and we're going to get direct and they're not going to be an intermediary and they're not going to tell us what to do anymore. And it didn't work out so well, um, especially because what usually happens is, um, you know, the when you have a successful you know, find like that, and people are pumping all over the place, the price of oil starts going down until at the pump, it's, they're not making enough on it to spend the money that they're, you know, fracking is a little more expensive than traditional drilling. Um, and at some point, the numbers just say, no, we walk away. And they literally walk away. I mean, they leave equipment sitting there, walk away. And people who you know, um, signed a lease and um, because they thought money was coming in, they bought a new car or sent their kid to college or whatever. And then the money doesn't come in because, well, we haven't drilled yet and you're getting a percentage of that. So there's 0% of zero. We look forward to bringing you John Sayles full episode in an upcoming season on a streaming network. But for now, we're excited to talk with him about his latest release. Publishers Weekly would rave at your most recent release, James McGillivray, A Renegade Story, upon first read that you have a knack for bringing many characters to life and making palpable the raw violence of war and the uncompromising inequality of the period. In this strong outing, the parallel stories of a Scottish rebel and a young Scottish woman pressed into servitude and sent to the Caribbean are followed in what they concluded was a worthy epic. Please reflect on creating that saga through both the eyes of Jamie and Jenny Ferguson. He is a survivor. Um, at first, he starts out with this idea of um, it, it's almost like the, um, you know, the, the lost cause. And that could be Irish rebels or Southerners after the Civil War or whatever, that um, somehow his family was slighted and that he and his brother should be inheriting this land that they're now just basically the tax collectors on. And that that's why he's in this fight, you know, um, he's not a Catholic. It's not that, you know, there's a Protestant king of, of England. Um, it's, it's really that. Um, but he, he's kind of trained for this role of being a go-between. Um, you know, he's, he's good at languages. Um, so he speaks, you know, English, Scots, Scots Gaelic, a little bit of Latin and French when the book starts and then he ends up in the new world and he's basically a slave of the Lenny Lenape for several years and he listens as hard as he can and pretty soon the chief and his wife have to say I think he understands what we're saying we better be careful with this guy um but he adapts mm. and he's in new circumstances and he realizes well, you know, uh, the Highlanders have been defeated. 
you know, the Jacobites have been defeated. What is there now for me? And all of a sudden he, he feels like, well, maybe there's a new, new equally anti-English person who could be a Lenny Lenape warrior, you know? And so he starts to take that persona on. Um, Jenny is a different case. She's this very smart, very adventurous, barefoot woman who has this two things going on is, is they've railroaded me. I didn't do anything. And they're accusing me of being a Jacobite supporter um, when I was just a bystander. They're transporting me to the new world instead of hanging me to put me into slavery forever. But wow, isn't that London out the window? <laughs> I've always wanted to go to London. You know, she's adventurous. And so, you know, she's illiterate, but she pays attention to everything. And she's a survivor too. And survival for a man and a woman in those days is a very, very different thing. Um, she has to kind of look around for, okay, I'm going to need a protector. Who's, who's the best candidate for that in the vicinity? And what can I do about that? Um, and she's pretty good at it. Um, and then has to deal with, oh, I was almost a slave. Here, my best friend here is a slave, but also the sister of the master <laughs> who I'm the mistress of. You know, it gets very, very complicated as to who to be and what to feel. And what are these rules? Should, should, I, should I, you know, obey any of them? Because they seem so messed up, you know, on the human level. Now, you have a very interesting way that you go about researching and then writing. Please pull the curtain back for viewers and how that works, if you would. I do have a rule when I'm, I'm doing a, a book like Jamie McGillivray, the one that, that is just coming out now, um, that has, is heavily researched. And that is, um, my rule is you can only do one week of research and then you have to sit down and write some fiction. And then when you finish that chapter, you're going to have some little question marks and gaps, and then you can go and fill those in. Um, and then maybe you have to do another week of research before you can even start the next um, chapter. So, um, you know, there's a, there's a couple chapters in um, Jamie McGillivray from the point of view of, um, you know, uh, you know, Reggie and Bert, who are these two, you know, dog face foot soldiers in the British Army. And um, I had to read a lot about what the British Army was like and what class those guys came from and what kind of uniforms they were in and where, where what regiments would have fought. And so, you know, how do I get these guys, you know, both at Culloden and the New World, what regiment would they have to be in? And those kind of things. How long did you work on this opus exactly? It runs from 700 pages from page one to done. I wrote a screenplay and I did the research and wrote a screenplay about it uh, over 20 years ago. I got a phone call from Robert Carlyle, the Scots actor, and I think he was acting in a, in a movie in Hawaii. And he said, I have this idea you might want to pursue about a, you know, a Highland Scot who's defeated the Jacobite and he's defeated at the Battle of Culloden fighting for Bonnie Prince Charlie. And instead of hanging him, the English transport him to the New World, and he gets involved with the Sioux Indians. And, and I immediately said, he'd have to live an awful long time to get involved with the Sioux Indians, but plenty of Indians on the East Coast, and there's the French and Indian War coming up. Um, so he could really get into some interesting stuff. And so just on spec, I wrote the screenplay and did a lot of research for that. As a director and writer who's done it for years, when you're bringing a battle scene to life for readers, as you did so vividly here, what do you recommend for aspiring writers trying to do so with the same believability? It depends on, on what, what viewpoint you're going to take. And so I do the Battle of Culloden um, and the Battle of Quebec basically from one character's point of view. And they, they kind of know the setup, um, but then it's just... If you're a Highland Scot, your one tactic is to um, grab your claymore and start running and screaming while the bagpipes are playing behind you and try to overrun the enemy before they can shoot you down in volleys. Um, and so what your, what your battle is, is this screaming charge and you either die, um, you're either shot, bayoneted to death, 
um, wounded and taken prisoner, or you overrun them and kill them instead. <clears throat> well, that's enough in, in one soldier's head, <clears throat> you know, for the probably 10 minutes that it took, you know, to get across that field. Um, there's a lot going on in somebody's head, you know, when it's survival and there's people getting killed all around you. You could, you could do it in a different way. So in, in um, uh, Los Gusanos, I do the Bay of Pigs invasion and I do it from a couple different points of view and you get more of a big picture of it because you're seeing it from more venues. Um, you know, so I, I, I think it really depends on, um, do you want the Napoleon you know, point of view or the foot soldier point of view? Out of curiosity, are you working on any other new adaptations from old scripts to novels? And anything else you have in the works creatively, we'd love to hear about before we go. I'm doing another adaptation of one of my screenplays I never got to, um, got financed or got to make. Um, uh, it's a screenplay that was called uh, To Save the Man. It's uh, set at the Carlisle Indian School in 1890. Um, when the Carlisle Indian School was the kind of um, template for, for all the later Indian schools that grew up where kids were taken you know, out of their communities, out of their tribes, um, forbidden to speak their language. Um, basically, the idea was if you're gonna survive in this modern world and not just die out, and, and by 1890, there were probably only a quarter of a million Native American people left you know, wars and disease had had gotten the population down that small from, you know, from, you know, m you know, multiples of that number before white people came. Um, you're going to have to learn English and you're going to have to act white and forget your culture. That's what's holding you back. You know, so that kind of cultural genocide coming from the most progressive people who were running the country, you know. Um, uh, Captain Pratt, who was, was the guy who started the school, was a progressive in his day. He was almost a radical progressive. He, he thought and would tell anybody who wanted to talk to him, oh, black people and, and native people are just as smart as white people. You know, nothing is holding them back but their culture. Um, so if that's what you're getting from the, the progressive people, you can imagine what it's like from the non-progressive people. Um, and just kind of reimagining that experience. Um, there was this strange way and that the Carlisle School was kind of the, the, the Alcatraz and the Harvard of Native Americans. Uh, people from tribes who never would have met geographically were meeting, some were getting married, they were exchanging ideas. Uh, the Pan-Indian movement a lot of the people involved in that were people who came out of the Carlisle Indian School. At the same time, there's a cemetery full of people who didn't make it. You know, kids who probably a couple suicides, um, kids who got diseases there, that, you know, a lot of kids together, you know, coming from places where, you know, there was almost no health, you know, the, the reservations, you know, whatever they were supposed to spend on health, they weren't spending it on there. So kids coming there already with tuberculosis. Um, and it's the time of the ghost dance and the wounded knee massacre. So it's a lot of stuff converging at the same time. And I'm pretty much done with it. I, I think I'm just gonna do one more little kind of breeze through of it and then uh, go looking for a publisher. To save the man, um, the, um, uh, Captain Pratt's, when he, he would make, you know, fundraising speeches, he would always say, in order to save the man, we must kill the Indian. Finally, has it made you proud as a storyteller to be someone who's brought light and given voice, often for the first time to the voiceless? Yeah, it's, it's certainly when I make a movie um, and, and when I write a novel, it's, it's something that I always think about is what haven't I read that I would have liked to have read? You know, um, what what part of this do I see in the history books that I don't see in fiction yet? Um, who, who do I who do I see in my in my real life who I don't see on a, a movie screen? Um, you know, Nelson Algren always used to say, you know, I try to go where I'm needed. And, you know, whether I'm needed or not, you know, I, I definitely go where I, I haven't. I feel like there's not a whole lot of competition there. 
You sure stayed original that way. Mr. Sales, it was an absolute honor speaking today. Thank you so much for taking out time to be on About the Authors TV. Thank you.